This is Think T Media. Our channel is working on humanitarian and human rights topics. We are enhancing our services, coverage, and content. You are welcome to comment, watch, and participate in our media. Please subscribe, share, and press the bell sign after subscribing. Thank you. Today programs. Headlines. Murder, robbery and lawlessness are sweeping the lives of civilians in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, sweeping the lives of civilians in the country. Dramatic situation, suffering continues among the poorest, not even the middle class is spared. Thursday, May 19, 2022. Eritrea accuses TPLF of planning fresh attacks against Asmara. Wednesday, May 18, 2022 What you need to know. Ethiopia troops seen moving toward Tigray after truce agreed. Buses carrying soldiers arrive in Kobo in Amhara state. Conflict has left millions of people in need of food aid. It is becoming hard to walk buying bread across Addis Ababa roads. There is high starvation, corruption lawlessness and step by step the people is exercising criminal busyness. Anything is stolen, the number of beggars are increasing rapidly. Tigrayan looted cars are sold in Addis Ababa, Oromia and South Nations nationalities and other regional states. Eritrean and Amhara thieves are involved in this business. We wanted to inform the people that they have to be far from this dirty business. Because, once the butcher is Abi Ahmed Ali and his allied shift to Amhara and the Eritrea Bad Man Administration are caught and brought under the law, you will be criminally and materially liable. As the chassis number is found in the road and transportation offices, anyone who is making dirty business will not hit himself then. Dramatic situation, suffering continues among the poorest, not even the middle class is spared. Thursday, May 19, 2022. Addis Abiba, Agenzia Fides, First we had the revolutionary uprisings against the government, then the hope with the election of Prime Minister Abai, but then came Covid. As if that was not enough, there is also the escalation of the war between the Federal Army and of the fighters of the Tigray People's Liberation Front, TPLF, at the end of which comes the war in Ukraine and the prospects of a very severe drought. This is what an anonymous source of the local Catholic Church told Fides, who described the devastating economic situation that is heavily affecting the country. The situation in Ethiopia is dramatic. Prices are rising, everything is becoming more and more complicated. The poorest are silent, they always suffer, but the middle class cannot even buy teff, the typical flower of the country, for their monthly needs with the current salary. The price of petrol has risen sharply. Unfortunately, the funds for the missions are also running out and in this situation it is becoming increasingly difficult to help the poor, the observer continued. In addition to the economic crisis, there are also clashes with Eritrea in the conflict region of Tigray. The situation is still very tense. According to the United Nations, a total of 1.39 million children in the Tigray region are currently missing out on their education due to the war, with serious consequences. Ethiopia continues to modernize its armed forces, and Parliament recently approved a five-year military cooperation agreement with Turkey worth around $63 million. GF slash AP, Agenzia Fides, May 19, 2022 Ethiopia troops seen moving toward Tigray after truce agreed. Buses carrying soldiers arrive in Kobo in Amhara state. Conflict has left millions of people in need of food aid. By Fasica Tades. March 28, 2022, 6.12 a.m. PDT updated on March 28, 2022. Hundreds of Ethiopian troops converged on a town near the border of the northern Tigray province, days after the government and rebels from the region agreed to a humanitarian truce after almost 17 months of fighting. Over the past few days, 32 buses carrying soldiers were seen in Kobo in Amhara State, south of Tigray, some of whom may be replacing personnel who were being rotated, Addis Uwetajo, the town's mayor, said by phone. 
while the additional forces may help facilitate the establishment of a humanitarian corridor to allow aid to be dispersed to millions of people who need it, their presence may also place the truce at risk. Neither the people nor the regional government have adopted the truce, Adesu said. There is a fear that we will be at risk if the federal forces move, so everyone is holding their ground. The agreement reached between the federal government and the Tigray People's Liberation Front on March 25th is the closest the two sides have come to a ceasefire since since hostilities erupted in November 2020. The government didn't immediately respond to requests for comment on the deployment. The TPLF won't do anything that stands in the way of aid deliveries, although it's closely monitoring troop movements, according to spokesman Getachew Rita. At this stage, there is no indication that such movements are meant for securing the road for aid, he said. Nor are we particularly at this point worried that the new reinforcements are meant to overrun our positions. Yilakal Kafail, president of the Amhara region, told regional officials on March 22 that the federal government and its regional allies plan to bolster troop numbers. Large Force the Ethiopia National Defense Force is now in training in order to carry this out. It has been engaged in organizing, training and strengthening itself, he said. The Amhara region is building a very large force. The fighting erupted when Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed ordered an incursion into Tigray after troops loyal to regional authorities attacked a federal army base. That followed months of tension stemming from Abiy's sidelining of the TPLF which had previously been the nation's preeminent power broker. Eritrea accuses TPLF of planning fresh attacks against Asmara. Wednesday, May 18, 2022 What You Need to Know The Eritrean Ministry of Information said the TPLF's main target is to reoccupy our land, which international law has recognized as the sovereign territory of Eritrea, and to recommit their hatred-driven looting and atrocities on Eritrean soil. Badmi, the main source of the 1998-2000 border war between Eritrea and Ethiopia, was granted to Eritrea in 2002 by an intermediate boundary commission. TPLF leaders have not reacted to Eritrea's fresh allegations. War drums are beating again on the rest of Ethiopia-Eritrean border after Asmara accused the Tigray People's Liberation Front, TPLF, of plotting to launch attacks to reclaim lost territory. Asmara's accusations, dismissed as baseless and ironical by observers, come a few days after rebel TPLF forces and Eritrean forces clashed in two fronts in Badmi and Rama towns which lie along their bordering territories. The Eritrean Ministry of Information said, it was no secret that the TPLF leaders were preparing new military attacks. Their main target is to reoccupy our land, which international law has recognized as the sovereign territory of Eritrea, and to recommit their hatred-driven looting and atrocities on Eritrean soil. TPLF's plot has the blessing and support of Western powers, they, Western powers, are rushing to deliver grain, medicine, fuel and other supplies in the name of humanitarian assistance before TPLF starts the new war, the ministry said on Tuesday without naming the Western powers. A long-standing tense relation between Ethiopia's Tigray region and Eritrea deteriorated in 2020 after President Isaiah Safwerki sent his forces to join the Ethiopian Federal Army in fighting the TPLF, a prescribed group. The Eritrean Ministry of Information further said that the Eritrean people would fight to defend country from any attacks. The international community has repeatedly urged the Eritrean government to withdraw its forces from Tigray in northern Ethiopia. Sumer Sihe, a local political commentator, says Eritrea has almost done nothing to pull its forces from Tigray in neighboring areas. It is such an irony when Eritrean officials accuse Tigrayan forces of preparing for war while their military forces are illegally present inside western Tigray, which directly violates international law, Mr. Summer told Nation. The Eritrean military has committed war crimes and crimes against humanity and alleged genocide in Tigray. If Eritrea wants to give peace a chance in the region, it should withdraw all its troops from Tigray.
TPLF leaders have not reacted to Eritrea's fresh allegations. All parties to the Tigray conflict, including Eritrean forces, are accused of committing grave human rights abuses, including genocide and sexual violence. Badmi, the main source of the 1998-2000 border war between Eritrea and Ethiopia, was granted to Eritrea in 2002 by an intermediate boundary commission. The border conflict claimed the lives of over 70,000 people. In 2018, longtime rivals Ethiopia and Eritrea formally restored diplomatic ties, ending 20 years of enmity with Ethiopia accepting to obey the commission's findings. Ethiopia's Tigray forces announce release of 4,000 army prisoners of wars. By Associated Press May 20, 2022 The Tigray forces fighting Ethiopia's federal army say they will release 4,000 prisoners of war as part of an amnesty. The Tigray People's Liberation Front announced the release on Twitter Friday amid an escalating war of words between Ethiopian and Tigray region officials over provocations and preparations for another round of full-blown war. The Tigray forces decided to release 4,208 prisoners of war with an amnesty, out of which 401 are women, according to the tweet. Most of them were captured, in fighting, outside of the Tigray region, and others joined the fight in a forced conscription, Bahrain Kabeda, coordinator of the prisoners' center in the region, was quoted as saying by the regional ruling party. Bahrain said those with disabilities, illnesses, and women who gave birth in detention were given priority for release. The decision to release the prisoners followed weeks of talks held between military commanders on both sides, according to a foreign diplomat in Addis Ababa, who said talks at the political level have not yet taken place. This is the second time Tigray forces have announced the release of prisoners of war. In July 2021 they announced the release of 1,000 Federal Army soldiers after parading them in front of the public. These releases are probably both a sign of goodwill and also of the acute food shortage in Tigray, William Davison, the International Crisis Group senior analyst for Ethiopia, told the Associated Press. Now no sufficient aid flows to the Tigray region have only less than 4% has arrived amid a prolonged lull in large-scale fighting, the federal government should restore vital services such as banking and advance the peace process by opening talks on a permanent ceasefire with Tigray's leaders, he said. Ethiopia's deadly civil war that erupted in November 2020 after federal officials accused Tigray forces of attacking an army base in the region is believed to have caused the deaths of tens of thousands of people. Aid groups say federal forces sealed off the region, especially since July 2021, making very difficult the delivery of food and other desperately needed aid. In recent months, the Ethiopian has relaxed the restrictions somewhat to allow a better flow of aid into the Tigray region. But Tigrayan civilian are angry on this act. They commented the prisoners of war have to be holed until the grave death of the butcher Abi Ahmed Ali and the sadist Isaias Afawerki. But now the prisoners of war will return to rape Tigrayan women. And this is the source of anger to the Tigray people. The released prisoner of war are the rapist who raped more than 120,000 Tigrayan women made more than 40,000 Tigrayan women HIV AIDS positive only in two zones and they are criminals. They have been committing massacres in different towns and churches, they have to be punished of the crime they have committed. The release of these criminals is the sign of undermining the people. They committed genocide, and genocide is irrebuttable criminal act. They are liable for the crimes of massacring more than half million Tigrayans. TPLF have been surrendered them more than five times each person, and now the same mistake is happening. Saeed Tigrayan in the comments of the social media comments. TPLF has been feeding these rapists, invading, looting and genocide's cruel troops while Tigray children are dying of starvation. What kind of political gambling is playing over the people of Tigray? Is every Tigrayan's question. Tigrayans are suffering from so many crimes committed on them. 
while more than 17,000 innocent Tigrayans pro-ENDF member are dying in detentions of Ethiopia while TPLF is releasing the criminals for free. This is shameful political gambling. Powers trials commence at Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam despite stalled negotiations and regional tensions by Steve Floyd Thursday, May 19, 2022, 8.01 a.m. On February 20, Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed visited the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, GERD, to celebrate initial power generation trials. Ethiopians rejoiced as their decades-old dream neared completion. For years, the previous government described the dam as a weapon in Ethiopia's war on poverty, a critical step toward environmental justice and an opportunity to undo Egypt's hydrohegemony. With funding from civil servant donations, diaspora support and the sale of bonds to private citizens, the GERD has become a symbol of national pride. Hashtags like hashtag it's my dam, hashtag gr dis your dam and hashtag Ethiopia prevails trended this winter, and people across Africa praised the milestone on social media. The trials will produce 700 megawatts, MW, of electricity, but the dam will generate 5,150 megawatts once filled to capacity. Such sustainable power will prove a boon for Ethiopia's economy, bring UN sustainable development goals within reach and benefit the broader region. But enthusiasm for the project is far from universal. Negotiations with Sudan and Egypt remain at an impasse, and these two downstream states have condemned Ethiopia's decision to begin filling the dam without a binding agreement on water sharing. In a region beset with political turmoil and armed conflict, stalled negotiations heighten instability and increase the potential for conflict. Saber-rattling and bellicose statements often punctuated the 10-year negotiations, and multiple crises now exacerbate this rhetoric. The region may soon experience extreme hunger after three seasons of drought. Ethiopia's Tigray conflict has created a humanitarian disaster. And the presence of 55,000 Ethiopian refugees compounds Sudan's domestic challenges. Moreover, clashes between Ethiopian militias and Sudanese troops over the disputed Al Fashka border region turned lethal in 2021, and there is speculation that Egypt could provide support to Tigrayan forces. Such dynamics imbue the region with exceptional volatility and complicate negotiations. As Ethiopia prepares for a third filling in summer 2022, the GERD dispute will further inflame these interlocking tensions. Absent a negotiated agreement, the potential for conflict looms. Overview of the dispute Spanning more than 4,000 miles, the Nile River winds across nine borders before it empties into the Mediterranean Sea. Yet the Nile's length belies its relatively small volume. Furthermore, 86% of its capacity originates in the Blue Nile of Ethiopia's highlands. Waters flowing from the Blue Nile are critical for downstream economies, as they irrigate crops, support fisheries, and attract tourists. In fact, for many rural communities downstream, the river constitutes the sole source of economic activity. But the Blue Nile also presents the potential for abundant hydroelectric power. And it is this prospect that has engendered protracted disputes between upstream and downstream states. With a projected cost of $5 billion, the GERD will create a 74 billion cubic meters BCM, reservoir 20 miles from the Sudanese border. Ethiopian Electric Power Corporation, which owns and operates the GERD, expects the dam to generate more than 5,000 megawatts of electricity once operational. When negotiations failed to produce an agreement on rights and usage, Ethiopia unilaterally began to fill the dam in July 2020. A second phase of filling occurred in July 2021, and the dam has now stored 13.5 bcm of water. The significance of this project for Ethiopia's economic growth and development is not easily overstated. In 2016, Ethiopia had approximately 2,300 megawatts of installed generation capacity, and, as of 2019, the World Bank estimates that half of its population lacks regular access to electricity. Such abundant power would help Ethiopia achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goal for affordable, accessible energy, and the dam could provide surplus electricity to the broader region. But downstream states do not share this rosy assessment. Due to the Nile's importance for the Sudanese and Egyptian economies, leaders in both countries grew concerned when Ethiopia initiated construction in 2011. 
For if Ethiopia fills the gird to capacity, the stored water will equal 18 months worth of the Blue Nile's flow. Egyptian and Sudanese citizens rely on the Nile for fresh water, and their agriculture depends on extensive irrigation networks. Both states fear that the dam could disrupt water flows, increase salinity levels and harm agricultural production. Indeed, the first gird filling in July 2021 disrupted Khartoum's water supply for three days, and irrigation pumping stations faced sudden shortages. Moreover, both downstream states operate their own hydroelectric dams and require steady, consistent flows to meet their power needs. As Sudan is closer to the GERD, it is also concerned that increasing sediment levels or the rapid release of stored water could physically damage its smaller dams at Mero and Rosaires. For these reasons, Khartoum and Cairo expressed grave concern over Ethiopia's decision to unilaterally fill the dam without an agreement. In April 2021, Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi warned of inconceivable instability in the region if the GERD affected Egypt's water supplies. History of Negotiations Trilateral talks, mediated by the U.S., opened soon after dam construction began, and initial efforts proved promising. In 2011, representatives from each country formed an International Panel of Experts, IPOE. When the panel submitted its report two years later, it called for joint studies to further explore technical issues. The states then agreed to a Declaration of Principles in 2015. Reflecting the principles of the 1997 UN Convention on the Law of the Non-Navigational Uses of International Watercourses, UN Convention, the parties committed to the equitable and reasonable utilization of the river's resources, acknowledged the obligation not to cause significant harm, and vowed to exchange data and information. Following the EPO's recommendation, the parties also agreed to establish a tripartite national committee, TNC, to conduct joint studies and solicit technical assessments from international consultants. Under the Declaration of Principles, the countries would provide the TNC with technical data needed to study water usage and establish safe operating parameters. Most importantly, all three states agreed to abide by the TNC and IPOE recommendations. Unfortunately, despite the Declaration's aspirational language, subsequent negotiations bore little fruit. The TNC engaged international consultants to conduct technical assessments, but the parties could not agree on baseline terms of references for the analysis. In 2018, the three states established a National Independent Scientific Research Group, NSRG, to assess the dam's hydrological, environmental and social impacts, but consultations broke down a year later without consensus. Ultimately, Ethiopia walked away from the negotiations in February 2020. Abi rejected a draft agreement prepared with the World Bank's technical input, and Ethiopia unilaterally commenced filling the dam in July 2020. The African Union, AU, sponsored a new round of negotiations, however, these efforts ended in April 2021 without any breakthrough, and Sudan refused to sign the draft final communique. When Ethiopia conducted a second filling in July 2021, Egypt referred the matter to the UN. Security Council over Ethiopia's Objections In September 2021, the Security Council issued a statement in which it encouraged the states to adhere to their obligations under international law and reach a binding agreement on the filling and operation of the GERD. But little has changed on the ground, and fundamental disagreements remain. As Ethiopia intends to conduct a third filling in summer 2022, Egypt and Sudan fear they may soon face a fait accompli. Tensions remain high, and mutual recriminations continue. Party positions and negotiating hurdles Regional leaders often speak of the Nile in poetic terms. Former Ethiopian Prime Minister Mele Zenawi once called the river the umbilical cord that connects the region. In an April 2021 letter to the UN Secretary Council, Sudan described the Blue Nile as an inseparable part of the history, culture, economy, and consciousness of the region's people. At times, the party's positions have matched this lofty rhetoric. Meles regularly extolled the GERD as a tool for regional economic growth, and Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir recognized Ethiopia's right to upstream development in 2012. But Sudan's support soured when Prime Minister Abi cast the dam in more nationalistic terms. The parties are now at odds, and each side assigns blame to the other. 
Five key issues currently impede a negotiated solution. Binding commitments for droughts. Egypt and Sudan desire clear commitments to ensure sufficient water is released during droughts or periods of low rainfall, something Ethiopia is reluctant to do. The parties have agreed on what constitutes a drought, but Ethiopia will not commit to release specified amounts of water. More broadly, Egypt and Sudan demand that all negotiated commitments be binding, while Ethiopia will commit only to voluntary guidelines and a non-binding dispute resolution mechanism. Timeline for filling the GERD A slower timeline will minimize the disruption for downstream users, but it would deprive Ethiopia of cheap, renewable energy for its people and economy. Although two fillings are complete, Ethiopia has previously expressed a willingness to fill the reservoir over a seven-year period and delay completion until 2027. Egypt, however, has argued that the reservoir be filled over an even longer period, possibly lasting 12 to 21 years. Analysts estimate that if the GERD remained offline for more than 12 years, Ethiopia would lose tens of billions of dollars in revenue. Role of Mediators in 2020, Sudan requested that the EU, US and UN mediate negotiations alongside the AU to narrow the gap among the parties. According to Sudan, such a quartet would add credibility to parties' assurances and guarantees. Ethiopia, however, rejects third-party mediation as outside the scope of the 2015 Declaration of Principles. Moreover, U.S. and EU influence with Addis Ababa remains at an adhere due to criticism over the Tigray conflict. Scientific and Technical Assessments Under the 2015 Declaration, the three nations pledged to provide data to the TNC. Such information would support studies to establish a technical baseline that addressed each party's concerns, like how filling will affect the accumulation of salts in agricultural lands. Egypt claims that Ethiopia failed to provide the necessary data, though Ethiopia dismisses these complaints. Furthermore, Ethiopia argues that the 2013 IPOE report already established that the GERD will not harm downstream states. But Egypt and Sudan note that the panel's report was not conclusive, and it actually recommended a comprehensive study to model downstream effects. Although the NISRG sought such technical answers, it disbanded without forging a consensus on technical issues. Prior water sharing agreements. Existing treaties and legacy colonial agreements also complicate negotiations. The Anglo Egyptian Treaty of 1929, along with a 1959 bilateral treaty between Sudan and Egypt, effectively allocated all water rights to the two downstream states and granted Egypt a veto over upstream projects. While Egypt and Sudan expressly recognized Ethiopia's right to exploit the Blue Nile in the 2015 declaration, both states still view these treaties as binding international agreements. Ethiopia, however, rejects any agreement that indirectly recognizes these treaties, as it was not a party to those negotiations. As a compromise, Sudan offered to include a clause stating that the agreement does not constitute recognition of any legacy treaties by any signatory. Such issues contributed to the breakdown of talks in April 2021, and changing domestic dynamics have complicated negotiations further. As Abi confronts prolonged conflict and growing ethnic tensions at home, the GERD presents an opportunity to unify the state with nationalist rhetoric. But such language may have driven Sudan's military leadership to align more closely with Egypt, adding to the general climate of mistrust. The potential for conflict. Transboundary water disputes implicate core national interests, the use of natural resources, the potential for socioeconomic development and the fear of environmental degradation. In many cases, disputed waters are also powerful symbols that loom large in the national consciousness. For Ethiopia, Sudan and Egypt, the Nile carries this potent strategic and emotional mix. Such sentiments constrain policy options, calcify hardline positions and increase the chance of diplomatic failure. In these situations, armed conflict becomes a distinct possibility. Each side has employed belligerent rhetoric in recent years. In April 2021, Sudan's foreign minister feared that Ethiopia sought to impose a fait accompli and put all the peoples of the region in grave danger. Sudan's irrigation minister then decried Ethiopia's decision to unilaterally fill the dam a second time, 
warning that Ethiopian intransigence would lead Sudan into all possible options to protect its security and its citizens. Similarly, many observers have interpreted various Egyptian statements as veiled threats of war, especially as Cairo allegedly requested that Khartoum permit Egyptian commandos to conduct a strike from Sudanese territory should negotiations fail. In 2013, then-President Mohamed Morsi declared that Egypt's water supply cannot be violated at all and warned that all options are open. Two months later, Egyptian ministers were unknowingly recorded on live television while discussing the situation. In the recording, ministers proposed that Egypt destabilize Ethiopia with military aid to the Oromo Liberation Front and spread rumors about bombing the dam. In March 2021, President al-Sisi declared the Nile's water a red line and untouchable. For its part, the chief of Ethiopia's air force recently extolled Ethiopia's military capabilities, threatening multiple plans to counter an enemy who knowingly attempts to derail the G-GERD project. Such aggressive words can incite public passions and limit leaders' policy choices when crises arise. Some rhetoric may be mere posturing, and President al-Sisi has downplayed talk of military options. Options. But a region wrestling with political turmoil, civil conflict and famine can ill afford additional volatility. Furthermore, the climate of mistrust bleeds into other areas of tension, such as Ethiopia Sudan. Ethiopia-Sudan border disputes and Addis Ababa's fear of Egyptian support to Tigrayan separatists. The need for a diplomatic solution is pressing. International law and the importance of shared facts. International law does provide guidance for transboundary water disputes. For instance, the 1997 UN Watercourse Convention requires states to ensure equitable access to transboundary waterways and avoid causing substantial harm. The International Court of Justice, ICJ, has reinforced these same principles. In pulp mills on the River Uruguay, Argentina v. Uruguay, the ICJ emphasized that parties must seek the equitable utilization of the river's resources and respect other riparians' rights of economic development. Similarly, in Gabsikovo Nejimaro's project, Hungary Slovakia, the ICJ found that Czechoslovakia's unilateral control of the Danube deprived Hungary of its right to an equitable and reasonable share of natural resources and highlighted the ecological effects of diverting upstream waters. But equity and harm are meaningless concepts without a mutually accepted technical baseline. In the Blue Nile Basin, equity requires an understanding of water flows during periods of drought and the potential impact of climate change. Similarly, any appreciation of harm must assess pre-existing sediment levels and consider how decreased water flow can affect downstream salinity. Such analysis is critical for settling transboundary water disputes. Indeed, the ICJ conducted its first fact-finding mission in 50 years for the Hungary-Slovakia case. And in Argentina v. Uruguay, the court deemed environmental impact assessments a requirement under international law. But such, such findings are even more vital in a region acutely vulnerable to climate change. To establish a scientific baseline will require time, expertise and cooperation, and it is imperative that the parties re-engage on these technical issues. Agreement on technical terms of reference could jumpstart negotiations, while additional data on water flows, sedimentation, salinity levels and projected power output could help parties quantify the benefits of cooperation and allay public fears. For instance, in a 2021 study, environmental scientists at the University of Virginia, Chapman University and Egypt's Alexandria University used commercial satellite imagery to study the effects of rainfall and runoff on the broader Blue Nile Basin. After tracking water levels during GERD filling, their analysis suggested that the GERD could exacerbate drought during periods of low rainfall. This is precisely the type of data the parties agreed to research and share under the 2015 Declaration of Principles. The AU, EU, and US should pressure each state to follow through on this commitment and support technical exchanges that build on objective, third-party analyses. The road ahead. The benefits of an agreement could not be greater. Successful negotiations would defray tensions in an increasingly volatile region. But it could also promote resilience for cyclical droughts and provide sustainable power for an energy-starved region.
Ada Suleshadu, a research fellow at the Brookings Institution, and Chaim Kassa, a professor at Miami University, have noted that power interruptions decrease Ethiopian, Egyptian, and Sudanese business revenue by, respectively, 6.9%, 6% and 1.2% annually. More consistent power would bolster economic performance, create jobs, and reduce poverty for all three states. States such shared benefits could enable leaders to garner public support for compromise and dial down the bellicose rhetoric. Despite these possibilities, negotiations remain at an impasse, and a third unilateral filling is scheduled for summer 2022. The international community has not remained silent. When Ethiopia walked away from the U.S.-led negotiations in 2020, Secretary of the Treasury Stephen Mnuchin, who hosted the talks, urged Ethiopia not to fill the GERD unilaterally. Once Ethiopia chose to proceed, the Trump administration paused $100 million in aid. More recently, President Biden has acknowledged Egypt's concerns and reiterated the U.S. interest in a diplomatic resolution that meets the legitimate needs of all three states. Similarly, the EU has urged all parties to establish a clear roadmap for renewed negotiations, emphasized the importance of an agreement for foreign investment and extolled the potential benefits for the basin's 250 million people. And after the second filling in 2021, the UN Security Council explicitly called on all parties to resume negotiations. But such calls are unlikely to change the parties' hardened positions, and a negotiated solution may ultimately prove elusive. Continued international pressure remains critical. On January 25, David Satterfield, the US Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa, met with the Egyptian Foreign Minister and discussed the stalled negotiations. On March 21st, he then traveled to Ethiopia for consultations about the Tigray conflict with UN, AU, and Ethiopian officials. Unfortunately, tension over Sudan's military coup and Ethiopia's operations in Tigray may limit U.S. leverage with Khartoum and Addis on other issues. Moreover, Satterfield has announced that he will step down in May after only four months on the job, creating a diplomatic gap that could impede U.S. engagement. Nevertheless, Ethiopia appointed Seelshur Bekele as ambassador to the United States in March. As Seelshur previously served as Ethiopia's Minister of Water, Irrigation and Energy and as the chief negotiator for the GERD, his selection may indicate a renewed willingness to engage on the GERD and curry U.S. support. That said, where Brussels and Washington lack influence, they should work through the other regional actors to incentivize cooperation. Pressure from other upstream states and influential Arab League members like the United Arab Emirates could encourage the parties to establish technical terms of reference, facilitate scientific exchange and re-engage in good-faith negotiations. Such steps would provide confidence-building measures and jumpstart the stalled negotiations. Ultimately, the GERD dispute remains inextricably linked to broader regional concerns and should not be ignored. As a critical component of long-term regional stability, a negotiated agreement would assuage trilateral tensions, foster growth for the entire Nile Basin and provide a diplomatic success for the African Union. Failure, however, raises the specter of protracted instability and renders each party more vulnerable to climate change. A binding trilateral solution, grounded in the principle of equitable use, must be found. Tigray has been under a de facto humanitarian blockade for a year, with the Ethiopian government and Tigrayan rebels, TPLF, blaming each other for preventing aid from getting through. Journalists are banned from entering the region, but recently VOA travelled to the town of Sokota, just 10 kilometres away from Tigray. Here, thousands of people displaced from Tigray by war and hunger congregate each morning outside aid points, set up by the UN and non-profits. Some days they receive food, mostly they do not. Many live in hastily erected metal shelters like Kasahan Baye, a father of six who arrived in Sokota from Tigray recently. This small bag of personal items is all he has. He left everything behind, including his family. I know my family has nothing to eat, but I can't do anything. I will try to bring them here if they survive until I can go back. I'm not cruel. It's because the situation is beyond anything I am able to deal with. 
Aid agencies say displaced persons staying in vast tents on the outskirts of Sokota are in a state of emergency for lack of food. In Tigray, they say some 700,000 people are living under famine-like conditions. At least 1,900 children have already died of starvation, say regional officials. But the full extent of the humanitarian disaster is not known due to an information blackout. Many are unable even to escape Tigray. Kasa Tagaru belongs to the Amhara ethnic group. She says her ethnic Tigrayan husband did not come with her and her children because he feared being killed due to his ethnicity by soldiers, either crossing the civil war's front line or when he arrived in Amhara. Is he alive or dead from starvation or something else? My nine-year-old daughter is always asking about him. Militia groups as well as military personnel are everywhere in Sokota, a buffer to Tigrayan forces just beyond the horizon. Rights groups have been ringing the alarm bells about ethnic-based violence and killings against Tigrayans by militias and security forces, including in the Amhara region. Establishing humanitarian corridors to allow people to escape Tigray would help alleviate the crisis, say advocacy groups. Absolutely, there need to be more ways for civilians who are trying to flee to get out. I mean, that is a basic principle in international law. That's a very basic kind of, you know, refugee 101 um, issue. Zenash Waku is an aid worker in Sokota. We are accepting displaced people that arrive here, even though they are from Tigray. That is part of being human. I believe people shouldn't suffer because of disagreement among politicians. Meanwhile, desperation continues to drive people to make the treacherous journey to Sokota across these rugged hills. The journey takes four days and nights without any food or water. Anyway, what have I got to lose? I would rather die trying to get out than stay here and die of hunger. Most people who spoke to VOA said before leaving to cry, they witnessed adults and children dying of starvation. Henry Wilkins for VOA News, Sokota, Ethiopia.